Thank you very much. We turn now to First Minister's questions and question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I offer the best wishes of the season to you, to the Chamber and to the people at home for a very happy Christmas? Um, could I also ask the First Minister, on the 28th of June in 2016, the Scottish Government's delivery plan for Scottish education promised a new specialist programme to recruit high quality graduates into priority teaching subjects. It was to be in place by the summer of this year. Can the First Minister say how many graduates it's recruited? First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, can I also uh, say to you, to the Chamber and to people right across uh, Scotland, a very Merry Christmas and, and best wishes for the new year. Um, as Ruth Davidson is aware, this government is taking a range of actions to encourage uh, more teachers generally uh, into the profession. And of course, the most recent statistics show uh, that over the last year, there have been more than 500 additional teachers coming into teaching, but also to attract uh, teachers into particular subjects. That's why just a, a matter of months ago, the Deputy First Minister uh, announced incentive schemes to attract teachers into STEM subjects, for example. So we will continue to take a range of actions coupled uh, with the governance reforms, coupled with the actions we are taking to increase transparency around the performance of our schools to make sure that we're driving up standards and closing the attainment gap. Ruth Davison. Presiding officer, I specifically asked the First Minister about her flagship specialist graduate route into uh, teaching, which she announced last June. And I asked her, how many graduates it had recruited and the answer which I don't think we heard in there was none zero because it hasn't even been set up yet here is the national improvement framework which was published last week this is Scottish education's report card and it clearly states page 52 that the government has missed the deadline for its specialist graduate recruitment program we're barely at tender stage so this is a program announced in 2016 due to be delivered by 2017 still not here as we head to 2018. Now also promised for June of 2017 was a new standards framework to help improve the school inspections regime. Can the First Minister tell us, has that promise been met? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of teachers, as Ruth Davidson, uh, I am sure, is aware there are a range of new routes uh, into the teaching profession that have been made available. And by the end of January 2018, it's expected that around 280 students will be studying on one of the 11 new routes into uh, teaching. There has been a 7.5% increase in the overall number of student teachers uh, this year. That builds on a 19% increase in 2016. Uh, and uh, as I said in my first answer, we also recently launched the £20,000 STEM uh, bursaries for career changers uh, to attract teachers into particular uh, subjects. So that is the range of action uh, we are taking. Um, in terms of improvement in our education system, again, as Ruth Davidson is aware, through the National Improvement Framework, we are taking a range of actions uh, to make sure that there is that focus on improvement in our education system. Inspections have a crucial part uh, to play in that, but there is a wider range of action underpinning our ambitions in that area. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, under the SNP, teacher numbers are down by 3,500 and her flagship programme hasn't been delivered. Only this First Minister could come to the Chamber and try and claim that as some sort of a success. But in that second bite of the recruitment cherry, she completely missed the question that I'd asked her, which was about a promised new standards framework for school inspections due to have been delivered by 2017. And the answer is it hasn't been delivered and we don't know when it will be. So let's stick with some broken education promises. Everybody knows that good school leadership is crucial for a good education. Even the SNP acknowledge this, which is why they promised to publish a national action plan to get more teachers to take the step up from a classroom teacher to become a head teacher. All the more important as so many head teachers are nearing retirement. The action plan was supposed to be in place by, yes, June of 2017. First Minister, where is it? First well, Minister. As, again, if Ruth Davidson 
uh, took the time to look in detail at these things, she would know, for example, that this government is funding uh, the Headship uh, Leadership Academy. Uh, that is working with Columba 1400, which is seeing large numbers of teachers uh, and head teachers go through that programme. Uh, we've also, again, got a range of initiatives to support leadership in Scottish education. Uh, we also have the highest number of teachers working in our education system since 2011. Uh, there were an increased number of school inspections over the past year, uh, and we will see that number increase even further uh, over the year ahead. The reality here is this is a government uh, taking a range of actions across all of these issues to improve standards in our schools. Uh, and of course, uh, we are seeing the outcomes of that across uh, a range of different areas, not least the increase in teacher numbers uh, that I've now, I think, mentioned about three times in the course of this exchange, which I haven't even heard Ruth Davidson acknowledge even once. Ruth Davidson. Let's cut through the back and forth between you and me and let's go and look at what the improvement framework says. Let's see what the scorecard says about that. When it comes to an action plan on head teachers, not only has the deadline been missed, the plan is not published, but the First Minister apparently can't tell us when it will be. So we have a scheme to get more graduates into teaching that's been delayed. We've got a drive to boost inspections, which we're still waiting on. And we've got a plan to get more teachers to become heads, which appears to have been shelved and that's just the tip of the iceberg because if you go through and we have all 75 actions that the government promised for education last year fully a third of the commitments have either been delayed they've been diverted or they've been ducked so this week we've had it confirmed again how tough things are out there with some schools having to shorten the school day because they don't have enough staff now, famously, the First Minister started this year again insisting that education would be her number one priority. At the end of the year, does she really think it looks that way? First Minister. Yes, I do. Because let me recap. Over the last year, we've seen more than 500 additional teachers uh, go into education. Uh, that takes us to the high, highest level of teachers in our schools uh, since 2011. As I said earlier on, through the 11 new routes into teaching, by the end of January, we'll have an additional 280 students in teaching because of that. We have the uh, bursary scheme that I've mentioned to attract uh, teachers into STEM subjects. We have the head teacher uh, leadership programme that I have spoken about. So again, we are a government taking a range of actions to make sure that we are improving education and closing the attainment gap. Uh, and of course, uh, remember, if we were to follow the advice of the Conservatives, uh, particularly around budgetary matters, we would have to take out of a, the draft budget published last week 500 million pounds over and above the cuts already being imposed by the chancellor that would not only wipe out the planned increase for the health service it would wipe out most of the pupil equity fund as well that is the reality we are taking the action we are putting the investment into education and that is what will deliver results question number two richard leonard uh, presiding officer, uh, can I wish you and uh, members of this parliament and the people who send us here uh, a very Merry Christmas and a peaceful uh, 2018. Uh, one week on from the publication of the government's draft budget, we now know that lifeline local services, local jobs, local wages are being hammered yet again by this SNP government. And we also know that under the Scottish National Party, our Scottish economy is forecast by the Scottish Fiscal Commission to be facing, and I quote, subdued and sluggish economic growth, slow productivity growth, slowing employment growth for the rest of this parliament. So, First Minister, is the Scottish Fiscal Commission simply talking Scotland down? First Minister. Our, our budget, of course, 
It is based on the estimates and the forecasts of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Interestingly, of course, uh, the forecasts that the Scottish Fiscal Commission makes uh, around growth are, are, are based on, uh, amongst other things, uh, two key factors. Uh, firstly, uh, Brexit uh, and, of course, issues... Tories don't like it. And, of course, concerns about lack of population growth. Now, if Richard Leonard is concerned about these things, as he should be, as I am, it makes it all the more strange that he has uh, appointed a Brexiteer uh, as his Brexit yeah. spokesperson, when what he should be doing uh, is getting uh, behind this government to argue for continued uh, single market uh, membership. It also, I think, would make a lot of sense for Richard Leonard to back this government in calling for greater powers over immigration for this parliament so we can focus on growing the Scottish population uh, and don't find ourselves at, at the mercy of the anti-immigration rhetoric and policy of the Conservative government. So there may actually be some common ground that we can develop here if Richard Leonard is prepared to have uh, the courage uh, of his convictions or what at least I hope would be his convictions. Richard Leonard. Well, of course, the, uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's uh, uh, prognosis for the Scottish economy is not just based on Brexit. It's based on oil and gas contraction, low productivity, demography and low private sector investment. Presi pre presiding officer, so no, so no matter how many times, how many times ministers say that the fundamentals of our economy uh, are strong, uh, it's clear that they are not, that they are weak. Research and development announced yesterday has grown, but it's far too narrow, with just 10 businesses accounting for nearly 40% of all new business research and development. Our export base as well is far too narrow, with just 15 businesses accounting for 30% of all our international exports. We've witnessed rising levels of bankruptcy, falling levels of business investment, and, and, the, and the SNP's own, and the SNP's own key economic targets, raising Scotland's GDP growth to the UK level by this year, is not met, matching the GDP growth of small, independent EU countries by this year, not met. Order, please. So what will it take? Listen, so Mr Leonard, Mr Leonard, Mr Leonard, hold on one second. Would members please listen to Mr Leonard's question and stop interrupting? And so, and so my question is to the First Minister and to the people on her benches, when are you going to snap out of your complacency? First Minister. Richard Leonard beaming at all of the applause he's getting from his friends on the Tory benches. Do you know what? It is right. Richard Leonard is right on one thing. Scotland's growth rate is not yet matching that of other small independent countries. I wonder why that is. So if Richard Leonard wants to join me in supporting Scotland becoming a small, independent, successful country, then I will welcome its conversion. But let's get back. But let's get back to reality. Right now in Scotland, the unemployment rate is close to an all-time low. The employment rate is close to an all-time high. Richard Leonard mentioned business research and development, we've now seen that exceed a billion pounds for the first time. Growth in business research and development is outstripping that across the rest of the UK. Uh, we've closed the productivity cap with the rest of the UK, but yes, now need to close it with our other European uh, competitors as well. And that is why the budget that Derek Mackay outlined 
uh, last week uh, had so many initiatives in it to support economic growth, from uh, the initiatives on business rates to make sure we're the most competitive part of the UK uh, on business rates, uh, to capitalise a new national investment bank, to increase even further investment in research and development. Now, if Richard Leonard uh, doesn't think all of that goes far enough, then here's an invitation uh, to him. Between now and the next stage of the budget, Richard Leonard and Labour it should come forward and tell us what further investments they want us to make in the economy. Uh, that would be a novelty for the Scottish Labour Party. Richard Leonard. Well, you see, well, you see beyond all the rhetoric and oratory <laughs> of the First Minister, <laughs> it's the loss. It's the loss of real jobs in the real world. So if, thi if, thi if things are so good, try telling that to the workers of the Airdrie Savings Bank, of RBS, of Quick Fit Insurance, to the workers, to the workers of Deuce and Babcock, of Ethicon and Tannoy, who have lost their jobs this year. Try telling it as well to the workers at Amazon who it's been reported today are being forced to make unrealistic targets this Christmas to try to avoid redundancy in the new year. First Minister, this is a company that you handed over millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to. So, so, you, should, so you, should be, you should be laying down the rules because what Scotland's economy needs is real and radical change. It needs a government with an industrial strategy to stimulate growth. And it needs as well a government that is prepared to stand up to big business. So will the First Minister, so will the First Minister once and for all accept that she is presiding over an economy which is not serving the people of Scotland and that the people of Scotland demand real radical and urgent change to her economic strategy? First Minister. It's kind of hard to know where to start with all of that. I mean, it is good to see Richard Leonard so enthusiastically enter into the spirit of pantomime season in, in that question. But let me just try and perhaps insert a few facts into the debate we're having. Firstly, the last Labour administration gave Amazon uh, more money uh, than this uh, administration has done, fact one. Fact two, uh, Richard Leonard has talked about RBS and Airdrie Savings Banks, uh, important uh, institutions, but has it really escaped Richard Leonard's notice that just like regulation of employment and most of the macro powers over the economy, banking regulation is reserved to the United Kingdom government. Yeah. It is not a responsibility of the Scottish government. It Has it also escaped Richard Leonard's notice that the unemployment rate in Scotland right now is not just close to a record low, it's actually lower than it is in uh, the rest of the UK. And Richard Leonard, uh, Richard Leonard is shaking his head. At the hat. That is actually uh, a matter of basic fact that perhaps he might care to research before he next comes to this chamber. But you know, despite the limited powers uh, that we have over uh, matters related to the economy. This is a government that does always stand up for workers. Ask the workers at DL, for yeah. example, yeah. that wouldn't be in a job right now without the intervention of this government. Ask the workers at Ferguson's shipyard who wouldn't be in a job right now. Or ask the workers of Bifab who would not be in a job this Christmas without the intervention. Because while Richard Leonard was having wee photo shoots outside by Fab, I was actually making sure that we saved that company from administration and kept those workers in a job. So that, that is real action to be compared with the empty rhetoric of Richard Leonard and the Scottish Labour Party. Thank you. We have a number of constituency questions today. The first from Jackie Bailey. The First Minister will be aware of the tragic fire at Cameron House Hotel earlier this week. 
I'm sure she'll join with me in sending condolences to the families that lost loved ones and to praise our emergency services, the firefighters, police officers and paramedics who attended, as well as the staff who played a critical role in evacuating the building. The investigation has yet to start because the building needs to be made safe. But can I ask the First Minister, when the investigation is complete, will she ensure that lessons are learnt, whether that's in practice or if there is indeed a need to enhance building standards regulations? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Jackie Bailey for uh, asking this question and raising uh, an issue which is in all of our minds uh, this week. The, the tragic fire at Cameron House Hotel on the morning of the 19th of December uh, sadly claimed uh, the lives of, of two young men and I want today to convey my deepest condolences to the families of the two young men who died uh, and send my thoughts uh, to all of those who were affected uh, by this tragedy. Uh, this horrific event demonstrates once again uh, how our firefighters uh, so willingly put themselves in the line of danger to assist others uh, on a daily basis and I know the whole chamber will want to send our grateful thanks to our firefighters and to all of our emergency services who responded. Uh, of course there will be a thorough investigation into what happened at Cameron House and it is important that that investigation is allowed to run its course uh, but I can give an assurance today that the Scottish Government with our partners uh, and indeed with the owners of Cameron House Hotel, will make sure that any lessons that emerge uh, from that investigation uh, are learned uh, and fully applied. But I think for now, Presiding Officer, all of us in this chamber will want to send our thoughts and our condolences to all of those affected by this tragedy. Can I call John Mason? Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think the, uh, the First Minister is familiar with the Belgrove Hotel in my constituency, which is allegedly a private hotel, but which is in fact a large homeless privately run hostel. It uh, can ask what the government's response is to reports that there has been an outbreak of Group A strep infections uh, in the Belgrove Hotel. First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I understand that the reported outbreak of necrotized and fasciitis uh, is inaccurate, but that the prevalence of Group A strep infections uh, is putting residents uh, at risk of that condition. Uh, and that in itself is, of course, hugely concerning. Um, I think it is important to remember that the Belgrove is not typical of homeless accommodation in Scotland. However, we are working closely with Glasgow City Council on this issue and on improving the service for uh, some of our most vulnerable people. The recently formed Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group is looking directly at how we can transform services uh, for those uh, that are homeless. Uh, we have, of course, also established a £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund uh, from the start of the next financial year to help us drive change and improvement. And Alison Johnson. Thank you. Edinburgh's Hogmanay Festival attracts visitors from around the world and is one of the highlights of Scotland's cultural calendar. This year, around 300 unpaid volunteers are being hired as Hogmanay ambassadors for the event, despite these roles being paid in previous years. Uh, the Better Than Zero campaign has described the move as using volunteers to displace paid work and have threatened to raise a number of tribunal cases against the organisers over the issue. Does the First Minister agree with me that we must have greater clarity over the role of volunteers at large-scale events and that volunteers should not be recruited as a simple alternative to employing paid staff? Thank you. First Minister. Um, yeah, yes, I do agree with that. Um, the delivery of Edinburgh's Hogmanay uh, is a matter for Underbelly, the company that has been contracted to produce the event by the City of Edinburgh Council. I understand that uh, the event will be staffed with uh, 1,700 uh, paid staff. Uh, can I uh, say this about volunteers? And I think it is important. Uh, volunteering is, is a good thing, and I think all of us across the Chamber would agree with that. Uh, volunteers uh, contribute hugely to festivals and major events. That was the case at, at Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games. It was the, the case earlier this year at the Edinburgh Festival. However, uh, those who contribute voluntarily to making these events a success must be treated fairly and they must never be exploited. Uh, volunteers should complement paid professionals uh, to deliver a, an event uh, and never replace those paid professionals. 
uh, the value of volunteers should not be reduced, uh, used to reduce contract costs. Uh, so we expect organisers of major events to work with Volunteer Scotland to ensure that volunteers are uh, treated fairly. Uh, and we would also expect organisers to follow the charter that Volunteer Scotland and the STUC put in place to strengthen relationships between volunteers and paid staff. Um, I welcome the fact that all parties in this particular dispute uh, have agreed to get round the table and discuss the matter with Volunteer Scotland. Uh, Volunteer Scotland has suspended promotion of the opportunities on its website until the dispute is resolved. Uh, so I hope this dispute is resolved quickly uh, and that Edinburgh's Hugmanay is the uh, roaring success that we have come to expect. And Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I also start by offering my condolences to those affected by the tra tragedy in Cameron House, especially at this time of year. Uh, I recently wrote to the Cabinet Secretaries for an, uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and also the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work regarding two important issues around the Hunterson site in North Ayrshire. Uh, one letter was a constructive proposal for economic regeneration of the site and promotion of green energy and the other on the testing of offshore wind turbines. But more than a month later, I'm yet to receive a response from either. So in the spirit of the festive season, would the First Minister ask her ministers to double check their inboxes before clocking off this afternoon? First Minister. I, I hope my ministers are not clocking off this afternoon would be uh, the first thing I, I would say. Uh, I, I hope that's not too much of a disappointment to, to any of them. Um, of course, I will uh, check the position with the, the Minister's concerned, I'm sure, uh, replies to the letters. I'm not aware of the, the detailed content of the letters, so I'm not able to comment in, in any more detail, but I'll ensure that uh, replies are, are winging their way to the member uh, and hopefully they are uh, on his desk in the early part of the new year. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, Gordon Edwards was on the BBC this week. Nicola Sturgeon should remember him. I've spoken before about his wait to get mental health treatment. Now he is angry that spending on mental health for young people has fallen in three health boards. This is despite Nicola Sturgeon telling him that spending would go up and waiting times would go down. But that wasn't true, was it? A majority of her health boards have failed to meet the basic target. I can tell her that in the last three years, over 10,000 young people have had their mental health treatment delayed. Can Nicola Sturgeon answer this question for Gordon? How much longer will young people have to wait before you deliver your mental health promises? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, let me address the issue of, of spending because I paid very close attention to the reports earlier this week uh, that came from freedom of information uh, requests. And uh, when you look into the detail of that, it is not quite uh, as it uh, appeared in those reports. The data uh, that was uh, reported uh, was not comparing uh, like with like. It, for example, was comparing uh, CAM's uh, expenditure, uh, actual expenditure in 2016-17 against budgeted expenditure in 2017-18. And as uh, members will be aware, that is not, uh, th those are not comparable figures because for a variety of reasons, uh, boards will spend more in year than they originally uh, budget for. So for example, if you look at one of the boards uh, that was cited in these reports, NHS Lothian, if you examine actual expenditure, in this financial year to date, that's April to uh, November, and compare it to the same period last year, uh, there is no reduction. Instead, what you see is that actual NHS Lothian CAMS expenditure has increased by 6%. Uh, so I think there is uh, an important point of detail there. I, I think Willie Rennie may be uh, saying something from a sedentary position. I'm trying to give him a detailed answer to very important questions that he has raised. Um, on the issue of waiting times, uh, the Government uh, and the Health Secretary is very clear we have more work uh, to do, much more work to do, uh, to reduce uh, waiting times for mental health uh, treatment uh, to levels that I would consider to be uh, the acceptable levels that we want. That is why we are investing record sums of money uh, in mental health. It's why the numbers of staff working in mental health services uh, are increasing. But that work continues uh, until we have no uh, young person that is waiting longer than we would want to have them wait uh, for the mental health health treatment that they need. Willie Reddy. I'm disappointed with the answer because her excuses will not hide the government's failings on mental health. Yeah, yeah. Nicola Sturgeon promised things would get better, but they have got worse. Her ministers delayed the mental health strategy. 
Had ministers delayed millions of pounds of investment? Had ministers delayed the suicide prevention plan? And I now discover an important part of the workforce recruitment plan has been delayed by our ministers as well. Delay, 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 whilst young people have to wait, wait and wait. Can Nicola Sturgeon tell us this? Is she proud of her record on mental health? First Minister. Uh, we will continue to do the work that is required to do to deliver the mental health services that not, not just young people, but everybody across our society has the right uh, to expect. Uh, Willie Rennie, uh, I appreciate that he is uh, seeking to make a, a particular point. Anybody fairly listening to my uh, last answer would not have heard me make excuses. They would have heard me firstly point out some important facts, and I, I think it is important that the public have uh, facts about these things. But also he, they would have heard me recognise that we have more uh, work to do. Some of what Willie Rennie has said in that question uh, is a mischaracterisation uh, of, of reality. Take the, the mental health Take the mental health strategy, for example, and Willie Rennie and I have had exchanges about this in, in the past. Uh, it was delayed at the request of the Health Committee of this Absolutely. Parliament because they uh, wanted to have more time uh, to input into that strategy. And it's important on all matters, but I think it's particularly important here uh, that we make sure that we have a strategy that has the support of people uh, working on uh, the front line. Uh, we all know the pressures in mental health services. More people are coming forward for treatment uh, because of the reduction in, in stigma, but that places uh, an even bigger responsibility in our shoulders to make sure that we can meet that demand. That's why we're investing record sums. It's why there are record numbers of people working in mental health and why we will continue to get on with the work that needs to be done to ensure that we deliver the mental health services that people have the right to expect. A further supplementary from Richard Lockhead. <clears throat> the First Minister may recall that it was this time last year that I first raised the impact of parcel delivery surcharges on customers in Murray in the north of Scotland. And since then, with the Scottish and UK ministers and others, including the Advertising Standards Authority, uh, pledging to act. So will she join me in urging those Scrooge-like UK retailers who continue to discriminate against many parts of Scotland to ensure that this is the last Christmas where customers are ripped off, especially given that we now know that Scotland's paying an extra £36 million in surcharges. And of course, I should say that given that, that at least Santa Claus will be delivering presents free of charge to all parts of Scotland, I'd like to wish the First Minister a prosperous Christmas and thank her for all her hard work in 2017. First Minister. Uh, thank you to, to Richard Lockhead and let me reciprocate those sentiments. Um, this, this, of course, is, is a serious matter and let me take the opportunity to pay tribute to Richard Lockhead for the fantastic work he has been doing to raise awareness of this issue. It is, it is deeply unfair that customers right across the north of Scotland in particular are still facing disproportionate delivery costs when buying online. And we've seen this week that is to the tune uh, of an extra £36 million in delivery uh, surcharges. Uh, of course, the regulation of prices for parcels is a matter reserved to the Westminster government. Uh, the UK government should take action. I certainly welcome the recent increased attention uh, to this issue, which is undoubtedly a direct result of Richard Lockhead's campaign. So uh, let's hope we see concrete action from the UK government soon and that this uh, is the last Christmas for consumers in the north of Scotland uh, to be so blatantly ripped off in this unacceptable yeah. manner. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, President. Also, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to promote road safety over the festive period. First Minister. The Scottish Government works with a broad range of partners all year round to promote road safety. Uh, over and above that, there are a host of specific initiatives during the festive period, such as Police Scotland's Drink and Drug Drive campaign, which of course is now underway. Gritters will be available 24-7 to deal with ice and snow and we have uh, necessary salt stocks in place, nearly half a million tonnes, which equates to 140% of all of the salt used last winter. In addition, Transport Scotland's multi-agency response team will be convened periodically to monitor conditions and keep the travelling public informed. Stuart McMillan. Thank the First Minister for that reply. And uh, this time of year is particularly challenging for our emergency services and does the First Minister agree with me that, that prevention is always better than the cure when it's the continual messages about drink driving or roads being mended timorously? Then the Scottish Government should never stand still and consider fully how it can best work with 
the, our, uh, our partner agencies to improve road safety in the country. First Minister. Um, yes, I, I think the member makes a, a very important point. Uh, in 2014, of course, uh, we reduced the drink drive uh, limit to send the very clear message that drinking and driving is unacceptable and it is simply not worth the risk. Uh, we did this with the aim of changing behaviour and preventing drink driving ruining lives. Uh, over the festive period, our excellent uh, relationship with all key partners, including local government, is key to delivering the road safety framework. And I'm sure all members would wish to pay tribute to all those who work tirelessly to keep our roads and our transport infrastructure operating and safe at this time of the year. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the issue of safety over the festive period, can I make a plea for gritting of icy pavements? It wouldn't cost an arm and a leg, but speaking of arms and legs would reduce unscheduled visits to A&E. First Minister. Well, of course, we have uh, seen an increase in orthopaedic trauma cases attending at our accident emergency uh, services over the last week or so uh, due to the icy conditions. So Christine Graham raises an extremely important issue, whether uh, at this time of the year in particular can make uh, footpaths difficult. Uh, that's why there are measures in place. The salt stock I mentioned in my previous answer uh, covers the salt stocks held by local authorities, trunk road operating companies, uh, and that that is held in strategic reserve. Uh, the Scottish Government, as the Trunk Roads Authority, is responsible for taking steps to prevent snow and ice endangering the safe passage of pedestrians and vehicles over public roads. The Scottish Councils, uh, of course, have comparable duties for local roads, and that includes all footways, footpaths and cycle tracks. Question number five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the figures from NSPC Scotland, which suggest that there has been a 42% increase in child sexual abuse referrals in the last year. First Minister. Well, all children should grow up free from the risk of abuse. Uh, these statistics highlight that there is more for all of us to do to keep our young people safe. The NSPCC indicates that the rise in referrals may reflect greater awareness of the risk posed to children and the need to take action in response. It also may be due to a greater willingness by children who have been sexually abused to tell someone what has happened to them. Uh, this suggests that victims of, of abuse now have greater confidence that they will be listened to and that appropriate action will be taken by agencies and professionals. Uh, we are, of course, all responsible for protecting children and I would urge anyone worried about a child uh, perhaps being abused to report their concerns to the police. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. Research carried out by the NSPCC found that there were at least 14 local authorities across Scotland where there were no services for child victims of sexual abuse. As we approach the year of young people, will the First Minister commit to ensuring that all child victims of sexual abuse in Scotland will have adequate access to the specialist recovery services that they require? First Minister. Well, it is uh, vitally important that all children have access to the specialist services uh, that they require. And in light of the members' questions, I will uh, discuss this issue uh, further with the relevant minister to see if there's more action the government should be uh, taking in partnership with local authorities to improve the availability of uh, those services. Um, you know, often when we see increases in uh, statistics of this type, uh, we can and we should look at that uh, as something of concern. It is of deep concern, but we should also uh, be aware that what often uh, lies behind an, an increase in statistics like this is an increase in awareness and people feeling more able to come forward. And that is something we should encourage. But as the member rightly says, when we're encouraging uh, people to come forward, we must make sure that the services are there to support them when they do. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to protect vulnerable people from rogue money lenders over the festive period. First Minister. No, illegal money lending uh, will not be tolerated in Scotland at this time of the year or at any other time of the year. Uh, we fully support the Scottish Illegal Money Lending Unit, which is hosted by COSLA, in its drive to investigate and prosecute those who prey on vulnerable people in this way. Uh, we're also working hard to raise the profile of credit unions, which provide ethical and affordable financial services for those uh, who need those services. And in addition, we provided around £21 million of funding for advice projects last year, helping people seek solutions in a range of areas, including money and debt. Uh, and of course, if any member of the public has any information on illegal money lenders, uh, they can report this in confidence uh, via the Trading Standards Scotland website. Polly McNeill. Despite the excellent work done by Trading Standards and Police Scotland, rogue lenders are still slipping through the net and continue to wreak havoc 
in some of Scotland's more deprived communities. Evidence collated by those organisations show that some of the methods include intimidation and demanding of sexual favours. I do welcome what the First Minister has said today and previously about the role of credit unions and wonder if she would consider a higher profile public information campaign, particularly in those communities, talking about the importance and the existence of credit unions. And does she agree that that might protect more families from these criminals? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I, I do agree and we will uh, carefully consider any proposals to uh, further highlight the important role that credit unions uh, play. Uh, credit unions uh, provide financial services to a range of customers and they are a very valuable option for many, including uh, those facing financial inclusion. Uh, we are already implementing the recommendations of the Credit Union Working Group, which were published last year. Uh, these include making available £300,000 to credit unions to develop junior savers schemes uh, and working with the sector to design a national awareness raising campaign which will be delivered during 2018. Uh, so I hope that campaign is something that members right across the chamber will get behind. And question number seven, Edward Mount. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government takes to acknowledge both seasonal workers and companies that operate over the festive period. First Minister. Well, we value very highly the contribution that temporary seasonal workers make to our economy throughout the year. Uh, I'm particularly happy to acknowledge the hard work and the sacrifices of those who are working at this time of the year to ensure that the rest of us can enjoy the festive period uh, with our families. Of course, the UK government's position on migration post-Brexit is likely to have a major impact on the availability of labour. Uh, and that is one of the many reasons uh, why we are lobbying so hard to maintain single market membership. Uh, I'm also determined that should the UK government continue down its hard Brexit route, the rights of all workers, including those in precarious employment, will not only be protected, but enhanced to help us deliver a fairer Scotland. Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer and let's see if we can get back on track. There will of course be many other people working over the Christmas period. Those in the health sector, police force, fire brigade and those keeping our roads and other services working. There will also be those who will be away from their families at Christmas, our servicemen and women. Whilst they might not all be in conflict zones, many will remain on call to respond to events in our increasingly dangerous world. Will the First Minister, on behalf of us all, wish them all a very happy Christmas and thank them for all they do on our behalf? First Minister. Well, in the spirit of consensus, uh, yes, I, I will. Um, there are many, many people working across our economy um, who, unlike uh, the rest of us, will not spend Christmas Day and the rest of the uh, holiday period with their families because they will be working. They will be on call, people in our emergency services, uh, people in our hospitality sector, people keeping the transport uh, system moving, uh, to name uh, but a few. We all, owe all of them a debt of gratitude. So let me take the opportunity to thank them uh, from the bottom of my heart for all that they do. Uh, wish them and everybody across the country a very happy Christmas. Thank you. And on a very nice note, can I bring question time to an end? Can I also wish all members, all our uh, visitors today in the chamber and everyone we try to represent across Scotland a very Merry Christmas and a happy and peaceful New Year. I close this meeting.